In the previous segment, um, I talked a bit about what imperialism uh, actually is. I try to provide you with a definition of imperialism. I want to move through this segment sort of looking at uh, some of the roots, but in a very brief fashion, leading up to what will happen in the United States in the late 1880s and into the 1890s as the United States expands abroad. And the fact of the matter is that talk of expansion had sort of always been part of, of U.S. culture and um, the idea of what America was. Uh, from the colonies of the British on the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi Valley and the Trans-Appalachian frontier, and then pushing on further west as a result of the war with Mexico, um, purchase of or or the agreement on Oregon and the Oregon Territory. The United States, prior to the Civil War, had already spread uh, from one coast, the eastern coast, to the western coast uh, and the Pacific coast. So this notion of expansion uh, is not entirely new. And indeed, even before uh, the Civil War, this sort of notion of manifest destiny was part of the American psyche. The Monroe Doctrine, as early as the 1820s, had established that the United States had interests that went beyond its immediate borders, that indeed the United States would pay very close attention to events occurring in the rest of the Americas, um, South America, Central America, and might, if it were powerful enough, uh, take action in, in, in the event something should happen with a European power uh, and the revolutionary movements occurring in the Americas. Just before the Civil War in the 1850s, there was considerable talk of uh, making Cuba or points in the Caribbean part of the South and part of the United States, uh, perhaps through territorial acquisition. Uh, one of those that comes to mind, of course, is the Austin Manifesto. But we also have accounts of numerous filibusterers uh, these are individuals who led crusades or campaigns to try and establish U.S.-like governments abroad. Well, anyhow, by the time we get to the Civil War, the United States really consists of sort of that lower 48 that, uh, that we had, had come to know that covered um, what the, the traditional boundaries, I, I guess we would say, of the lower 48 in the United States. Not long after the war, however, um, Secretary of State William Seward would undertake, among other things, to, to broaden America's territorial control beyond the immediate borders of the lower 48 states. Uh, we know, in part, we know Seward through the purchase of Midway Island in the Pacific, which comes in 1867. Um, there had been an issue with a naval officer out in the Pacific, and the United States had seized the island of Midway and claimed it then as U.S. territory. More, more well-known, perhaps, is the, um, the, the purchase of Alaska. Um, Alaska being cold, being quite barren, um, having a native population but very little European uh, settlement, it didn't seem perhaps like Alaska was a grand purchase. Of course, um, little did we know about the resources uh, that were there. But in 67 as well, the United States will pay approximately $7.2 million uh, to Russia for the purchase of 591,000 square miles. Even so, um, it will come to be known, Alaska will, as Seward's Folly, as a mistake, an icebox, and not worth the money that was paid. But in a fundamental way, with both the purchase of Midway and Alaska, I think it becomes clear that Secretary Seward, and perhaps more broadly, the Lincoln administration before and then um, the Republicans after, are looking to the West and looking to the Pacific and the Pacific Rim for markets and for trade. And we see here the initial steps establishing an American presence in the Pacific that would then lead to connections to markets in Asia, uh, vast markets indeed. Now, it's worth saying that not all Americans favored any kind of expansion and certainly didn't favor this notion of imperialism. Um, the United States was never really outside world affairs, 
But the imperialist crusade, the, the imperialist effort, really takes off after 1880 in the United States, aside, of course, from Seward's purchases and the claiming of Midway. The arguments that anti-imperialists, as they are called, uh, made uh, really were cultural in many ways. Um, two of the best known, perhaps, uh, two of the best known anti-imperialists were William Jennings Bryan and uh, Andrew Carnegie, and they led the charge the, to try and slow this uh, persistent American involvement abroad. Um, sort of engagements that perhaps we shouldn't have been in. Nonetheless, the arguments of the anti-imperialists were, among other things, that um, the conquest of peoples against their will really went against the ideals of the Constitution, the basic ideas of the United States about freedom and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and such. They also argued that there were dom domestic priorities, uh, issues here at home that needed to be resolved and were more important than expansion abroad. There were risks. There was a possibility of, as we spread out, coming into more and more conflict with other nations that were practicing imperialism and ultimately ending up in war. So business, many businessmen felt that the risks that were involved in imperialistic uh, uh, undertakings were just too risky. There was too much at stake. Others sort of went at it from a racial perspective, an ethnic perspective, and I talked in a lecture just a little bit previous uh, about the way ethnicity and race played into ideas about labor and about poverty and about um, radical ideas here in the U.S. So it sort of makes sense from that perspective that many Americans would wonder about bringing um, peoples from Asia, uh, from the Pacific, under U.S. domination, or people in the Caribbean under U.S. domination, if that would entail getting sort of mixed up in all these ethnic and racial issues that many Americans felt were just tied to ethnicity, tied to race. Whatever the case, in order for the United States to move forward with an imperialistic program, what would be required? would be a rationalization that could overcome um, these arguments made by anti-imperialists and the political power and the political will to spread the United States abroad. Part of the argument becomes the argument of civilization. It's the old argument. It's the argument that by sort of conquering either physically or in terms of ideas other people the United States is spreading civilization, but more importantly, spreading liberty, spreading the ideals of the United States. And there's always a tension there, isn't there? This notion that you can somehow spread ideals of peace and liberty with force against someone's will. Very, very problematic notion. And yet, it's that very tension that lies at the heart of this period in which the United States expands drastically into the Pacific and ultimately into the Caribbean. So we have to ask as historians, I think, what changes? Um, what begins then to lead the United States from, from a nation that is tied specifically to North America into being a nation that's both a world power and that claims territories abroad, territories beyond its immediate continental borders? There are a lot, of, a lot of possible answers to that, and, and you know, I, I'm not claiming that I have the answer for any of this stuff or any of, of, of this material, but I'm going to kind of narrow it down to a few things, and I think one of them starts with understanding something we've already talked about, and that's how the economy of the United States transitions from the Civil War through the early 20th century. Uh, it is becoming an industrial economy. It's producing goods as never before. And one of the things that producers always have to look out for would be markets, places that you can sell the goods being produced. There was already a belief, in, already a belief in the United States, um, really after the Civil War, as the American economy had, had begun to change during the war, that the U.S. would need to start looking out 
for new markets, that it would have to eventually deal with surplus production that would go beyond what the American market or other markets in the Americas could sustain. This very clearly is something that ties into depression, economic depression. You know, it would, th th these ideas would rise to the top as the American economy plummeted. And indeed, we can see in terms of U.S. exports what happens over the course of this period. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, the United States exports amounted to approximately $234 million. By 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, American exports are running somewhere around $2.5 billion. Um, there were as many Singer sewing machines, if you're familiar with the Singer sewing machine, uh, abroad, there were as many abroad as there were here in the United States. And besides just markets in which to sell good, you also have U.S. investment spreading out, going abroad. Uh, in 1914, the same year I'd mentioned earlier, United States investments abroad reached approximately $3.5 billion. Many of those were in Latin America. Um, in 1970s, US, U.S. exports to Latin America were somewhere around $50 million. By 1914, that had gone up to around $300 million. Um, indeed, in 1899, two of the largest uh, fruit importers merged to form the United Fruit Company, and they owned, for instance, more than a million acres uh, in Central America as late as 1913. Uh, they owned railroad and steamship lines, and many of the utilities in the countries where they operated. Now, the reason I mention Latin America here for an example, it, it's merely to su suggest the economic ties that had developed over time, over this late 19th century, between the United States and other nations, nations abroad. And if you remember what I talked about in the last segment, I sort of talked about a procession of steps that, that are involved in imperialism. And the first one that I mentioned was investment. And you can see that happening both in terms of markets, in terms of production taking place abroad and shipping goods back to the U.S. for sale. You can see American investment growing over the course of the late 19th century outside the immediate borders of the U.S. It should come as no surprise then that from the late 19th century on into the 20th, the United States will be intimately involved with protecting investments in Latin America, Central America. Uh, one example that comes to mind immediately is Mexico. As you know, the United States will be heavily involved in military expeditions into Mexico just prior to our entry into the First World War. But it's not just Mexico. It doesn't take long in that progression of steps from investment to changes to the culture, political culture, the, whatever it may be in the countries where investments are made, and then the need for security eventually pulls in, uh, pulls in the use of force. Um, in this case by the United States, but it could be another imperial nation that has investments and interests in a country or on an island or wherever it may be. So point number one, I think one of the things that drags the U.S. into sort of imperialist policies in the late 19th century will be the changing nature of the economy, the need for markets, and American investments abroad that the feeling is have to be protected. We also have, as I mentioned earlier and mentioned one more time, we have notions about the changing frontier. I told you about Frederick Jackson Turner's The Significance of the Frontier in American History. But very clearly by the 1890s, by the time that imperialism reaches its peak, um, well I say its peak, by the time it really takes off, you already have that sense, I think, that something that's been fundamental to the United States, which is the frontier experience, is no longer possible in the lower 48. It's not going to be possible. It's, it's, it's declining. It's going away. It's fading. And so what you're, you're going to be left with perhaps is a question of, well, what do we do now? It didn't take much of a leap to say, well, 
Uh, perhaps we continue to expand, but we do it beyond the shores of this continent. Uh, we expand south, we expand west into Asia and into South America. And there, was, there was actually a good bit of talk of this. One of the people that comes to mind, and we'll mention him a little bit later, is, is Theodore Roosevelt. Um, his notions of manliness were tied to notions of the frontier, um, to the West, and he's also a major, major figure in the um, thinking behind imperialism, and U.S. imperialism in particular. There's another element that I, I want to throw in here uh, that I think has a role in, in America moving to becoming more imperialistic, and that's race and nationalism. In Europe, in particular, one of the major ideas uh, that had begun to be espoused, and, and the, major, the, the major figure espousing the idea was, was a fellow named Herbert Spencer, uh, was the idea of, of social Darwinism. Darwin's efforts on natural selection and what you know, we kind of commonly refer to as evolutionary theory or evolution, Darwin's efforts were predominantly biological. Others would consider the social and, and cultural implications, though Darwin uh, in his latter works would, would think about that as well, uh, the notion of specifically the relationship of, of a human being to, to an ape, um, to a, a lesser form, and what it meant to be human. But it didn't take long for people who wanted to, to use Darwin's ideas for sort of social engineering or other purposes to adapt Darwin's ideas uh, for other uses, uses other than he had perhaps intended. Social Darwinism amounts to a sort of pseudoscience. And it draws from ideas about natural selection, notions about the status of particular groups within the human community that because certain individuals or often it's ascribed to groups portray or have certain characteristics, say poverty, uh, say low education rates, poor hygiene, whatever. The idea that develops this pseudoscience is that you take Darwin's notion of natural selection, the strongest will survive. And that some human beings, those who are strongest are superior to other groups of human being who don't display the characteristics that are used to define strength. Now the interesting little quirk here, of course, is that those defining what it means to be strong, those who would often set themselves up as the superior people, well, they're the same people who are defining what it means to be superior, what those characteristics of superior, superiority are. And lo and behold, they can often engage society and, and go about their task of de definition in ways that ensure that groups who don't have those characteristics won't have those characteristics. That they can be portrayed in ways that set them apart as different or, to use another term, as the other. Not strong, but weak. Not civilized, however you define that, but barbaric. Well. There was a lot of talk both in Europe and ultimately in the United States about the implications of Darwin's ideas in this pseudoscientific sort of social way. And those ideas could be applied to race. And they add to this notion that imperialism becomes a sort of missionizing effort to bring civilization to groups of people, i.e., in this case, Asians, or the African or other populations of the Caribbean, or the Mayan or Latino populations of, of Central America that simply lack the characteristics of strength. In other words, we can go, we can educate them, we can save them, we can make them whole, we can make them like us. Now, there's a problem. Natural selection is natural. And if you've been selected out because of a mutation, there's nothing you can do about 
Not really. I mean, maybe there's gene therapy, but you know, there's nothing really you can do. So implicit in the use of Darwin to justify defining some individuals, some human beings as lesser or as the other, and then suggesting, well, we can uplift these people, we can pull them up to our standards, we can teach them how to live. The implication, the, the underlying sort of reality of Darwin's ideas is you can't. And so it's a no-win. That's one of the great sort of mechanisms of racial thinking. You can rationalize it, you can justify it based on doing good, you know, helping your neighbor, making them better. Even while the underlying assumption is no matter how hard you work, no matter how much you try, your neighbor is not going to get any better. They're never going to be able to overcome a basic limitation, which is not cultural or social, but natural. And so it's a no win. There's just no way for one of the sort of lesser sort to dig their way out, no matter how hard they dig. This type of thinking becomes enmeshed in imperialism. Um, one of the terms that comes, comes to mind, of course, is this notion of the white man's burden. And it's often associated with Rudyard Kipling, who of course is British, but it expresses ever so well that sense that we have an obligation to lift up those who are less well off than we are, to teach them how to be more like us. That's the white man's burden. And the burden, too, is this notion, well, we never can succeed. They'll never be like us. Instead, there was a dominant Western notion, an Anglo-Saxon superiority. You see that term over and over and over again in the documents of the late 19th century, this focus on Anglo-Saxon origins, almost a, a, a willingness, a desire to tie one's origins back to this Germanic roots. There's also a tie to religion. All of this, religion, blood and lineage, it's all bound up into the ever so rational, ever so rational project of the West. And the United States is part of that. Let me just, let me just, uh, read you a quote. This comes from a book called Our Country, which was published in 1885, Our Country, and it's a book written by Josiah Strong. And here's the quote, and if you'll pardon me for looking at the text just a second. The Anglo-Saxon, as the great representative of a pure spiritual Christianity and civil liberty, is divinely commissioned to be, in a peculiar sense, his brother's keeper. Add to this the fact of his rapidly increasing strength in modern times, and we have well nigh a demonstration of his destiny. It seems to me, right strong, that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxon race for an hour sure to come in the world's future. That quote encapsulates a great deal of the cultural rationalization that I'm talking about. A rationalization that would provide a cover, would provide a reason, a basis for imperialism, which was about a great deal more.